Church. Hello, I'm Kathleen. Hi, Renee. Hi, everybody. I'm Kathleen. I'm the director of Women's Ministries. Um, do we have any kids here in the sanctuary? Yes. So let's have the kids head on back with Jordy for Kids Ministry. So if you're new to Mountainside or if you're not yet connected with our church family, we'd like to help you because we know it can be hard to be connected to a church family. Um, so in order to do that, go ahead and grab your green pouch. You'll want to fill out a green card for us to connect with you, a blue prayer card if you would like prayer, or the red card if you would like to serve on one of our serve teams. So we've got some great events coming up. Um, on Wednesday, September 8th, we've got our monthly Dare Men's Meeting. That's going to be here at Discovery Fellowship at 630, and Pastor Davis is going to be our speaker. For our ladies, on Friday, September 10th, where we have a ladies' night out, we're going to be going line dancing. That's going to be at 7 o'clock at the Ballroom of Reno. And then on Sunday, September 12th, we have Baptism Sunday. It's going to be during our regular evening service time, so we're not going to be having a morning service. So uh, please come out and support your um, fellow church family members that are going to be getting baptized. It's an important day for them. So lastly, I want to tell you guys about a new women's ministry offering. So ladies, do you sometimes feel like you have a hard time getting into God's word? Um, I know it's hard because we want to get into God's word and we want to read the Bible, but it's hard to find time and sometimes it's confusing and it makes me feel bad and I think it makes us feel bad. So I'd like to invite you for, um, to join me for one-to-one -one Bible reading that's going to be starting in a few weeks. One-to-one -one Bible reading is simple and it's enjoyable. We're going to be pairing up with a partner to read um, a selected book of the Bible once a week for about six weeks. It's easy to join. So um, you'll want to sign up. You can do that now by writing on your Connect card, um, Bible reading. I'll be contacting you and to let you know some of the other ladies that would also like to read with somebody. Once you pick your partner, then um, you'll find a time, and then you guys will start reading together. So I'll be, uh, I'll be doing one-to-one -one Bible reading, and I hope to get the chance to read with you. Um, it's going to be starting pretty soon, so you'll want to go ahead and sign up for that. So with that, let's bring up Pastor Dawson for our sermon. Thank you, Kathleen. Kathleen used to do announcements once a month, and then COVID happened, and we didn't have church for a year. So, um, so thank you for that. <clears throat> All things women's ministry, you can contact Kathleen and sign up. And um, again, we're just trying to get people back into the Word, back into fellowship with one another. And uh, I wanted to give you a quick update on where the church stands. I'm trying to make sure that everybody's in the loop on this. I hate not being in the loop. And I, I know that sometimes churches have an issue with communication. It can be hard. So I just want to say that we had one more lease opportunity arise that we've been holding on in our back pocket. <clears throat> and it, it really wasn't the perfect fit, but it was a fit. And so finally we reached out and they said, Oh, you're a church. No way. So there's that again. So we have run into that more times than I can count now. So at this point, we have absolutely nothing. So I'm going to lay out a plan for the fall and winter, which buys us some time that we're always looking for a lease or an, uh, some kind of an option. We're always looking. But let me just lay out the fall plan. That way you have a plan. If you received a pick six, that's really important. That's going to tell you AMs and PMs and what we're offering and how we're offering and all those kinds of things. So in September, um, next week, I believe, is an AM service only. Uh, it's Labor Day weekend, so AM service only. The week after that is AM, PM. I'll be preaching through this sermon series. The next week after that is AM, PM, I believe. Is that right? I didn't grab that with me. Oh, I'm sorry. So, sorry, Labor Day is a.m. The next week is p.m. only, Baptism Sunday, September 12th. Dave, you, you literally can't leave. I'm going to literally be looking at you like, I don't even know what I'm saying, but it sure would be nice for Dave to be like, or. Next week, a.m. only. The week after that, p.m. only here. 
a few doors down is a pool that we get to use for baptism, we have like five people getting baptized. Would you please make it a point to show up for that service and encourage them? The week after that is a.m. p.m. The week after that, we were unable to rent our gazebo at the park. And so because we don't have our gazebo, uh, we will be p.m. only on that week. And then starting October 3rd, October 3rd is the first Sunday of October, things change. So hang in there through September. And then October 3rd, we execute our fall winter plan, elder approved, which is this. At 4 o'clock, I would love you to join me for my new life group, which will be, I'm calling it Christianity 101. It's a lot deeper than that. So if you are a Christian and you're like, I, I want to know my doctrine. I want to know theology. I want to meet some people. I want to have fun. I want to ask questions. Uh, that'll be every Sunday night at 4 p.m. Church will start at 5 p.m. Dinner at 6 p.m. For the fall and winter, 4 p.m. Christianity 101, 5 p.m. service, 6 p.m. dinner, always available. We're going to try to make Sunday evening kind of an event. Um, there will still be youth ministry going at 5 p.m. It would move to the same time as service. Uh, listen, pretty soon here, the clocks are going to change when? Do they change in November? That's when the depression starts. Is as soon as the clocks change, the depression starts. Pretty soon it's going to be dark at 5 p.m. You might as well come out, join me for some in-depth theology, Christianity 101. It's the basics of our, of our, uh, of our um, Christian faith. I promise you, I don't care how much theology you know, I'm going to tell you something you don't know. So it's for everybody, 4 p.m., 5 p.m. service here. We're moving an hour back because we've got people who are like, my kid goes to kindergarten the very next morning, and it sure would help to get a little bit of time. That way we can get ready. That gives that. And then 6 p.m., you can leave at 6. That's okay. You don't have to stay for dinner. But if, if you're like me, here's dinner Sunday evenings. Hey, honey, what do we, what do we serve in the kids? No clue. You got anything? Literally nothing. Uh, what do we got in the freezer? I don't even know. What do we got in the refrigerator? Literally nothing. You might as well stay for dinner. We, uh, what I'm thinking is once a month it'll be a potluck. We all bring some food. And then the other times the church will be providing dinner for you. Um, I'm looking forward to it. That's the best plan we have. Now, if you keep praying and we find something, which it's going to be an act of God himself because there's nothing. If we find something then everything I said, scratch it. It's all gone. And then we put together a whole new plan. And I'm not going to go into that because I'm just going to confuse all the men in the room just like I'm confused. So back to the Bible. We're in Matthew chapter 5 tonight if you want to turn there with me. Um, I ended up short a little bit on my sermon series. I'm going to blame COVID and different changes. And so here's what I decided. I have had a hard time in 2020, 2021. I really have. And things in our world, I kept hoping that we were going to like get through COVID and by now, and, and by now I mean when we were told that we just, just like stay home for three weeks and then in three weeks, I thought in three weeks my life was going to go back to normal. My life's not normal now, not today. I don't expect my life to be normal it might not be normal for ye- normal the way it was for years. And it might be that God says, I don't actually like that. I, I actually want it to be something new. And he has that right to do that. He has the right to change things. And so um, I put together a four-part sermon series on the four things that are critical for you in your faith to get through this and to be used for the rest of your life. These are four things that you need. They're not novel, they're not new, but they're critical. I'm finding more and more that um, when people will tell me that they're extra Christian or they have a new found faith or they have deeper teachings for me, that oftentimes they tell me things that are interesting, 
but they almost forget these very essential, basic things that our Christian faith is built upon. I'm going to give you four things over the next four or five weeks. I think baptism is the only break. And I'm telling you, I need you to do these four things. They're going to help you get through the rest of this year and in your life to come. I wrote some things down because I want to say them in the right way. I don't often just read. But I'm going to read this because I need to say it in the right way. So 2020 and 2021 have been interesting to say the least. As a pastor, I have counseled many people over the last year and a half who have faced some very tough times. We have personal problems, professional problems, political problems, we have public problems, and we have pandemic problems. You see what I did there? I mean, it's all peas, and it was all problems, and it was just, it was so nice. Thank you. Thank you, Israel. I appreciate that. That's... Me too, my Hawaiian brother. Thank you. We've had all of these problems. We've had to face situations that we weren't ready for. We've had to make important decisions about our health and the health of people that we love. We've had to wade through information and misinformation. Some of us have lost our jobs. We've had to reinvent ourselves. Some of us have lost friends. Some of us have been sick. But everybody has lost something. Everybody. I have personally found myself unprepared. I haven't always had the right tools for the situations that I have had to face. When I went through Bible college and seminary, they never gave us a class on how to lead a church through a pandemic. They never told us how to lead a church when your government shuts your church down. I'm not sure anybody would have even guessed that that was something possible. I've been challenged in ways that I did not want to be challenged in, and I know that I'm not alone in that. I know that everybody here faced something that you thought, I don't want to be challenged in this way. I just don't. If I could go around it, I'll go around it. If I could go under it, I'll go under it. But unfortunately, God's like putting me straight through the middle of it, and I have to face this. So here are some of the questions that I ask myself in the middle of the night. While the world seems to be in chaos, how can I have peace? <clears throat> what are a few things I need to focus on instead of, I often feel pulled a hundred ways, and I'm always thinking, all right, back to the basics. What are, some, what are the critical things? What are some critical things that I need to be doing? What tools do I need to possess in order to navigate this time in history? And what will help me achieve my goals in my Christian life? So I broke down four tools, four aspects of the Christian faith that will guide us through this pandemic. And I'm saying we'll guide you through the rest of your life. Tool number one. We're going to hit one a week. You and I need to be living a life of love. Number one, you and I need to be living a life of love. If there was anything that was in short supply over the past year, it's love. I have seen shouting, blaming, fighting, hating, mockery. I've seen divisions in the church. I've seen fighting. I've seen Christians become more about politics than the kingdom of God. I have seen Christians leave solid biblical churches over masks. I have seen Christians check out of church during COVID, and they've never actually checked back in. I have seen Christians judge one another harshly over open-handed positions. I have seen Christians that are so afraid of dying that they actually stopped living. I have seen so many Christians concerned about themselves that they forgot about the needs of other people around them. But love, that I haven't really seen a whole lot of. True, loving, pure acts of kindness. With that, we pick up in Matthew chapter 5. It's Jesus' longest recorded sermon, sermon, the Sermon on the Mount, uh, Matthew chapter 5. and We're going to be in verse 13. You 
are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Christians were created to make an impact on the world. Some of us aren't making an impact because we forgot that we're created to change things. Some of us aren't making an impact because we're lost in sin. Your life is so ungodly and you are so deep in sin that you forgot that you're about the things of God. But some of you are really making an impact, but you don't see it and you don't give yourself enough credit. And I'll tell you why. Because in America, we only value big. So when something's big and it's on television and it's televised and it changes the world and it's a judgment or it's a case or there's millions of dollars behind it and there's change, we go, that's change. That is awesome. But when somebody in the quiet of their home, without anybody knowing, with their own money, helps someone, we don't even count it. And there's people in our congregation who are loving and changing the world, but you're doing it in a very small way. Last time I checked, Jesus seemed to think that small things mattered. He even said, if you have the faith of a mustard seed, which is very small, you can move mountains. If you are a quiet person serving behind the scenes, looking to bless others, love others, and make someone's life better today, then you are actually changing the world even though it doesn't feel that way. And that matters. We have to get out of our head that change means a mega church gets millions of dollars and gives it to the city, and they're on the front page of the newspaper. It's a wonderful thing. It's great. It is change. It is help. It is good. But at the same time, we have to say, I did something for a person, and I'm making the world a better place, and I'm showing love, and I'm showing the fruits of the kingdom of God, and I shut up about it, and nobody actually knows about it. That counts, too. Both things are important, but I fear that when things aren't big and bold and boisterous and, and on the front page of the newspaper, I keep saying the newspaper like anybody gets the newspaper anymore. Uh, if it's not on social media, it doesn't matter. And the fact of the matter is, it does matter. So Jesus says, listen, you are salt and you're light. Salt is a preservative and it gives taste to food. In other words... Christians make things better that are already good in society. We make them better. And the bad things in society, we fight against. So, just like salt makes food taste better, it does. Lots of it. Especially chips. And salt fights the decaying process. In the same way, every Christian on this planet should be in good areas making those things better, and they should be in bad areas fighting against injustice and unrighteousness. Christians must be involved in their society, and when Christians are involved, involved in their society, it means that everything is better because the Christian is around. We'll get more of that in a moment. Christians are also light. Light is meant to shine and give direction. The need for light implies that the world is dark. The world needs direction. The world needs light. They need the light of Jesus. He's called the light many, many times in Scripture. So it's pretty cool that his followers get to reflect his light. Matthew tells us how to do that. Verse 16. 
so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. I wish this verse said, so that the people in darkness can hear your finger-wagging lectures, and after they hear your lectures and your condemnation, they will repent of their sin, and they will trust in Jesus as their Savior. I would love it. Don't say it right now because you'll ruin my sermon. But say it to me privately. I would love to know if anybody ever lectured or condemned someone into the kingdom of heaven. I've tried. And it does not work. Um, The Bible says that it's our good works that point people back to the Father. Our Christian faith must result in practical, practical good works which makes people's lives better around us. And unlike the Pharisees, the Pharisees did good works and then said, look at my good works. Christians do good works and say, because of the Father, I'm able to bless and love other people. You would really have to go to him to figure out where I get my power and energy and infilling from. So, how are you being salt and light? And I'll tell you the Allison and I talk about all this all the time. While I talk about it, she's graciously listens. Uh, we live in a world now where everyone wants to scream and yell and change things that we literally, none of us can change it. I can be mad about masks. I can be mad about vaccines. I can be mad at the school district. I can be mad at the president. I can be mad at the D.C. I can be mad at Afghanistan. I can be mad at a mad, 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 mad. And that's just stuff like away from me. There's stuff in my neighborhood. Do you know how many dead trailers and cars are parked in my neighborhood now? Do you know how infuriating that is? I'm amazed. Trailer after trailer after trailer. We can't even walk our dog without running into a trailer. That's illegal. You're not supposed to just be able to park a trailer or a dead car on a city street forever. Guess how much I can do about that. Nothing. Yeah, there was a pipe. I've called. I called. You know what they did? You got a call, call. They did nothing. <laughs> then there was a pile of rocks across our street for two months. A pile of rocks. And Alice and I were like, okay, what can we do? How can we proactively, Christianly do this? She's like, I think we knock on the door and say, may we help you move your rocks? And I'm like, that is awesome. That sounds like a fight. Because I'm going to go up and say, knock, knock, knock. Can I move your rocks? And they'll say, who do you think you are offering to move my rocks? I want my rocks in the middle of the street. That's why I put them there. And I just slink away and go, God bless. You know this. You can even try to help people. And it doesn't always go right. But we're supposed to be salt and light. We're supposed to be trying. But during the last year and a half, what I find myself doing is putting my eyes down, 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 down just into me, just in here, just going, I'm hurting, I'm depressed, I'm mad, I don't like, I wish, I'm bitter, I'm angry, what about me, why aren't those people changing, why isn't that happening, why don't we, why do I, why, why? this morning I'm preaching in the park, because that's where God has me now, as an itinerant preacher like John the Baptist, and a man pulling a, a cooler like, like scraping a cooler decides to walk literally behind me. I'm here. I'm there preaching the word. And he goes. I'm having a full, like, I'm just standing there like. Staring at Allison and she's like. I'm like, a man just drug a cooler behind me. There's a whole park. I know these are little things, but I say them because you're all facing little things. You've all faced like a hundred little things. I know you have. And it starts twitching your right eye. And you're like, I don't want to face another thing. I don't want another rule. 
I don't want another law. I don't want my kids to have another fight. I don't want to have another fight. I don't want another nosy neighbor. I don't want, la- I don't, I don't. I- and all of this is packing in on you. And I'll tell you what it does. It just puts your eyes down and you start thinking, I'm just here to preserve me. And God says, that's not why you were actually created. You were created and you were saved so that you could preserve other people because you're supposed to be salt and light to the world. Instead of saying, how can my spouse and my kids make my life better? You need to wake up and say, how am I going to make my spouse's life better and my kid's life better? Instead of saying, my neighbor's trash and his rocks and his stuff and it's everywhere and we see it and it's, how can I make my neighbor's life better? How is my neighborhood better because I as a Christian live here? That's a critical question. But I'm so over, I mean, we COVID, we go two steps forward, we take three steps back. I'm so exhausted that sometimes I'm thinking, sure it would be nice for my neighbor just to be nice. Because that would be nice to be near and it would be helpful. But that's the wrong focus. Are the people at your job better off because you work there and you're a Christian? And I'm going to, I'm going to, I wrote this out because I want to say it in a certain way, okay? And and just, you know what I mean. If you know me as a preacher, you know what I mean here, but just bear with me and listen to the whole statement before you get up and leave. You aren't being salt and light by casting a ballot. We must stop thinking that any government system is going to make anything better. It's true that you need to vote with a good conscience and you need to honor God in that. But voting the right way is not what Jesus has in mind here. He has in mind you and I actually getting our hands dirty, digging in and making other people's lives better as we make our society better. It's too easy to just have a bumper sticker level of Christianity or you put it on there and you're like, I'm saving people. You're not doing anything. It's, it's hard to go, well, I voted a certain way and that happened and then now, now that's their job to do. It's not their job to do. It's not the government's job. It's your job. So I'm going to challenge each and every one of you tonight. You need to put in your head that you're going to do one good deed every day to somebody. You're going to be salt and light in a practical way. And I do not care how small it is and I'm going to give you an example of small and lame So on date night, my poor wife has to put up with me doing good deeds. She's like, where are we going to dinner? I'm like, we're actually going to go do a good deed quick. She's like, seriously? Yep, you get to come with me. We're going to do a good deed. And here's my level of good deed. I'm going to set the bar about that high on the good deeds that I'm asking you to do. I like to go to Maverick. I love Maverick because I love soda and chips. <laughs> Maverick sells soda and chips. I can walk into Maverick without, without a mask or with a mask, and they love and accept me for who I am. And Maverick just offered a self-checkout. If you don't know this, you got to get down with this. You don't have to talk to anybody. You grab your soda, you click it, you pay with your card, and you walk out. It's fantastic. At the Maverick that I love, there are broken down shopping carts now because our world is getting worse. So now in South Reno, you see smash shopping carts and people all over the place now that I didn't used to see. Somebody took a smash Walmart shopping cart and put it up on Maverick's mailbox. So every time I drive in at this level, I look over and there is a smashed cart, Walmart shopping cart on top of a Maverick mailbox, and I get to look at it every day. And I felt God told me, you need to deliver Walmart's shopping cart back to themselves. I told you I would put it really low. So on date night, I said, get in the truck. Let's go get a shopping cart. And she's like, no, seriously. 
I, I said, I, we're, gonna, we're gonna do a good deed. So we jump in, we get the shopping cart, throw it in my truck, deliver it to Walmart, and I felt really nothing. I don't know. But you know what? If every one of us went around and picked up one thing, our entire society would be cleaner. It just, it just would be. It's like when you're golfing and you repair a divot and then you fix somebody else's divot, right, on a green? That's what you're supposed to do. Speaking of golf, uh, this last Saturday we had our golf tournament. Dave and Nika's team beat my team by one stroke. Yeah, it's exciting. I broke all of my clubs that afternoon and threw them in the Damani Ranch um, swampland. So if you want clubs, they're there. I'm done with that sport. <clears throat> If Pastor Dave beats me at anything, that, that'll be the end of that thing. <laughs> so, I'm asking you, here's, I say this, it's a stupid thing, and I said it because it's stupid. I've had some other good deeds where I was like, I think I blessed that person. But here's all I'm asking you to do is you've got to get your head, you've got to get your head up. You've got to get your eyes up and on to other people. Because the more you get inward and the more you focus on yourself, the more you're actually going to slowly die. That's what's actually going to happen. Skip down to verse 43 of Matthew chapter 5, verse 43. You have heard that it was said... You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes the sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? You therefore must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Well, that's convicting. So the Old Testament never says, when Jesus says, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy, the Old Testament never teaches people to hate their enemy. In fact, the Jews were sent into a country to be the, uh, ultimately a blessing and a light for Yahweh. It was really the Pharisees and the religious leaders who had, had these false teachings of hating your enemy or especially hating the enemy of Israel. So Jesus talks about this, and the reason he talks about this is because we don't like laws and commands. So every time we read the Bible, we think we're special, and we don't have to obey. So we read a command of God, and we think, oh, that's awesome for other people, um, but, and it applies to most people. But right now, I'm in a season of my life where I get special treatment and that verse doesn't apply. I'm saying in a facetious way what I've heard my entire pastoral career. Listen, the Bible is written to all of us and none of us get like special treatment where we don't have to obey because our life is a little bit harder. So I don't get to say, so the Bible tells me the anger of man does not accomplish the righteousness of God. That's a real verse in a real Bible. The anger of man does not accomplish the righteousness of God. I don't get the, but I'm special. You see, you don't understand all the things that face, are facing me, and you don't understand my life and children and my work and my job, and I was really stressed out, and you don't understand what this person said. So I'm allowed to come home and be angry. No, you're not. You don't get special treatment. When my kids were littler, they didn't get special treatment because they acted good in a store. That's called bare bones being a human. No human falls down on the ground and screams for an ice cream bar. So if you, it, I, I, I wouldn't say, hey, if you don't scream and embarrass all of us, I'll get you a candy bar at the end of this shopping. No. That's called being a person not acting that way. But if you learn something, yeah. You want to learn golf? I'll buy you golf clubs. You want to get better at golf? I'll buy you better golf clubs. Sure. You want to learn a trade? You want to learn something? Yeah, let's throw money at that. But I'm not willing to throw money 
because you acted in the ways that God asks you to act. It's not like, I don't get that. I don't act loving for one day, and at the end of the day, I'm like, God, how awesome was that? You owe me what? A candy bar? A blessing? An answered prayer? What do you owe me, God? Because I was good. I was like totally good. I didn't throw any fits for a whole week, and I didn't lash out in anger, and now God owes me. And God says, no, I don't owe you anything. You are behaving like the child of God that you are supposed to behave like. That's it. You're not doing anything special. But when I run into a harder verse, I want to say, I get special treatment. That verse totally applies to that person, but I don't believe it applies to me in the same way. And that's just not true. So... I want to talk about this for a moment. When we talk about our enemies and loving our enemies, I'm guessing that everybody in this room has an enemy. I'm guessing someone has been hurt by someone to a degree where they're not just an enemy, but they're really evil. And so sometimes we come to Scripture and the Bible says, love your enemies, and you're right now, put your enemy in your head or someone evil or someone who has hurt you, and you go... I, help me out. I don't even understand what that looks like. I'm supposed to love someone who every time I loved them in the past, they only heaped sin and brutality on me? How can that actually be possible? Why in the world would I love that person after what they did to me? God is not saying that you need a relationship with evil, sinful people. God is not saying you have to trust people who have hurt you. God is not saying that you have to soak all the pain up so that you have a relationship that nobody actually wants a relationship with. All of the damage that has been done is different with everybody in the room, but wisdom must be used in each and every one of these situations. What God is saying, though, is that it's not your job to hate or to dole out justice on this person. Sometimes the most loving thing you could do is just let the person go back to the Father's hands and say, Father, I I actually trust you so much that I'm going to release this person. I'm going to release what they did to me. I'm I'm going to put them into their hands. I don't want to be around them. I don't need to speak to them. I don't want a relationship with them. But Father, you know what? If one day they repent of their sin, would you let me know somehow? Because if they repented, if, if they had a repentance plan, if something radically changed, then let me know, Father, and maybe I could talk to them again. But you are not called to have a friendship with every person who has done evil to you. So if you have someone like that, I would suggest a prayer, something like, God, this person belongs to you. I've been hurt to the point where I don't want a relationship with them, and having a relationship with them will only bring me pain, suffering, and bring sin back into my life. So they belong to you. I will stop hating them because that's only hurting me. By the way, you doling out hate, have you seen... The hate on social media, wow. People will get hurt and they'll just verbal like, boom, pain. I see people calling other people out in their, like tagging them. This person's a pile of, mm, er, tag them and you can, er, and your mom tag, she can, all, I'm like, I'm not supposed to be reading this. This is not. Do you know what? So I'm guessing that person feels really hurt. But when you, when you, when you give out like that, do you know what everybody's doing around you? They're doing this. The very thing you want is attention, love, and care. It's the only reason you would do that. You're you're hurting so bad, you want to tell the world, I'm hurting, and I need someone to hurt with me. 
and I want other people to see that that person is evil, and I want you to treat them like I want to treat them, and they deserve it. And yet you verbal give all that out, and people are like, I'm just backing away from you slowly because I, I don't understand all of this. Talk to a counselor. Talk to someone you trust. Talk to a friend. But you just hating people. I'll tell you, the, the person, <laughs> they already blocked you on Facebook or whatever. They don't care. The people who hurt you in those ways, they think it's their goal to be in your head rent-free. So they're excited that you're mad. They, I know this is hard to believe, but there are people who, like, I, I fuel on chips. They fuel on your hate. Your hate and your venom, actually, like, they like that. Don't give that to them anymore. Just say, God, I, I trust the Father so much, and I hope you do too, that through His grace, His righteousness, His justice, you can hand them over and go, they just belong to God now, and I'm just going to allow Him to work in there however He wants to work. It's too easy to hate. I'll close with this. And we live in a day and age where we hate people. We hate their politics. We hate their positions in life. We hate their life choices. We hate their thoughts. We hate their cars. We hate where they live. We hate them. I can't listen to the news anymore. For I tried. I listened to the news for 10 minutes the other day. And within 10 minutes, the, the subtle message was, we're right, and you should hate them. Let me tell you in life, rarely is it that simple. Typically in life, things are a little more complicated than that. And even if we're supposed to hate them, hate's not a good thing. It's not going to fuel you. It's not going to help you in your life. Hate is fleshly and it's simple. And unfortunately, and I say this out of my flesh, the point Jesus is making is God still loves them. You're like, God, why can't you hate them too? <laughs> and he says, because they were created in my image. Now, that doesn't mean that God's justice won't be brought upon their life later. That's God's business. Anybody ever have a kid tell you your business? It's my favorite thing. So all your kids get in trouble and you're doling out discipline and one kid decides to pipe up and go, hey, actually, that was worse than mine and that person might and just so you know and that. And, and you're like, you know nothing. You literally know nothing and now you get extra discipline. <laughs> and yet I turn to the father and go, let me tell you your business. That person and that person and him and father strike that guy and, and I can see the father just looking at me and going, this is not your business. You're nothing. I'm the father. I'm the creator of everything. You have to trust me with this stuff. Stop telling me my business. It is your job to be salt and light and to love people as much as you can. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for your goodness and your grace in our lives. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for coming and dying on a cross for our sins. That is not our good works that saves us. It is your blood. We want to pray for our enemies. We pray for those who persecute us. Father, we want to be salt and light. We actually want to make someone's life better today. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. During the uh, worship, you can come forward and take communion if you would like. Um, and just do that on your own.